Yes, I am. Hi, sorry, just getting uh, getting off mute, getting the video set up. So, hey, everyone. Uh, so thank you, David, and thanks everyone for joining this morning. Um, here, I will get the slides up so you can all see them. Um, there was a question in the chat also about availability of slides. And yes, my slides should be available for download on the uh, event website. So bear with me just one moment. And there we go. All right, so uh, as David said, I'm going to be talking about generating software bills of materials for embedded devices and IoT at build time. Um, and in the, I, David, I really liked that uh, supply chain integrity map slide that you showed, uh, showing the different stages of the software development process. And um, in that map that you were showing, this fits into the, really the, uh, I think it was the third section of, of that process, the uh, build and verification stage. Um, what this is about is going to be about having that ingredients list of the software that you're building and specifically generating that ingredients list at build time so that you have it available and to distribute along with your software right when you build your software. So uh, the specific context that we're going to be talking about is for a project called Zephyr. And Zephyr is a Linux Foundation project that we support. Uh, it's a real-time operating system for embedded and resource-constrained devices. Uh, it's written mostly in C, and it's built on top of a couple different existing tools for its build infrastructure. So it heavily uses CMake to manage builds to generate its, uh, its make files or its build files. And then it uh, uses a tool that the Zephyr community has built called West, which is a meta tool for running the builds as well as running other actions such as taking the uh, generated binary and deploying it onto devices. So, um, and at a high level, the build process here involves compiling the source files from the Zephyr, Zephyr operating system itself, uh, then also compiling the source files for your own application that you're running on top of that operating system, statically linking them together into one binary blob, and then deploying that binary blob onto a device. And it's, it's that process that uh, the fact that in, it, instead of having a full distribution of software, we're generating a single binary blob that makes it particularly helpful to have a software bill of materials because it's, it's that much harder to go back and figure out what's in that binary rather than being able to do that after the fact. So we'll talk about that more as we go on. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just to help orient for folks who aren't familiar with Zephyr, I'm going to give a very high level um, just understanding of the build process, which should look familiar to anyone who's, um, who's done similar development. But basically, on the upper left-hand side here for the slide, uh, there are source files that comprise the Zephyr operating system itself. So a variety of C source files, headers that get included. Um, on the upper right-hand side, we've got your own application that you're building to run on top of Zephyr. Again, sources, headers that get in included. Some of those headers coming from your own application that you've written, some coming from Zephyr, some coming from a Zephyr SDK, if you're using that. And then really everything at the bottom is what gets generated as build products. So um, the libraries that get built and then that get, then get linked together into that final binary blob. Um, and we'll come back to this slide later on as I get into some of the specifics, but basically you can kind of group those together as I was saying, that on the upper half, you've got the different sources, which you can split in different logical groups. And then at the bottom half, you've got the build products and the build results of that whole process, uh, coming down finally to that binary blob. So, um, and I see that there are a number of questions coming through in the chat. Um, Please, uh, Jillian, if you can jump in, if there are any questions that I should uh, answer as I'm going through, that would be great. Otherwise, there should be time for Q&A at the end. So, uh, all right. And then the other, just another view, uh, and we'll also come back to this, but another view on the build process for Zephyr is because it uses CMake, CMake defines a variety of targets that are the different, build, the different stages in the build process. Um, and some of those are kind of utility stages. Some of them are taking actual sources, building them into library files or build products that then go on to the next stage. Again, coming down to that final, uh, that final binary at the end. So um, the goal for all of this, I think as David was saying uh, earlier, was to be able to shine, uh, shine some sunlight into what's in that binary that you're getting at the end of the day. So um, being able to tell easily after the fact what pieces went into that binary, what specific source files did we use that went into that binary blob? Um, because as someone is do as 
uh, Zephyr developer is doing development, they are, of course, changing the sources. They might be, mod because it's open source, they might be modifying the operating system files themselves. They'll certainly be modifying their own application. They'll also be updating the, the uh, you know, pulling new versions of the Zephyr sources and so on. So the source files that they're building from are going to be constantly changing. Um, and being able to tell after the fact, you know, six months later or two or two or five years later, which source files, which specific versions of source files went into a particularly bin a particular binary blob is challenging. Um, the fact that it's a single binary also makes that post build analysis challenging because, um, you know, for other develop other developments of software, other uh, systems that are not for kind of embedded uh, resource constrained devices, you might not have a single binary blob. You might have something more like a file system or uh, a system that's built on top of uh, a ecosystem like NPM or PyPy or something where there are uh, kind of a setup for dependencies and for versioning dependencies that's really what you're interested in. Here, it's specific source files that are going into a single binary at the end. So that post-build analysis can be challenging. Um, and one, one thought here is certainly you could and you probably should keep the source files around for anything that you're, that you're uh, building and certainly anything you're distributing to customers or to end users. Um, you know, certainly it makes sense to keep an archive of the, those specific source files around. The, challenge with just saying that you'll do, you'll do that and that takes care of everything is that first off you'd have to you'd need to be trusting that those sources hadn't been modified post build that the ones you've archived are the exact versions you use to build that binary uh, and then second the sources are going to be a little hard to interchange or review even if you are distributing your sources to customers um, it's still you know harder to be able to quickly tell is this the is this the version of the sources that were vulnerable or uh, it, yeah, it's harder to review that than it is to review just a hash that's in metadata. So, um, so the goal here is really that we want to create a software bill of materials, a record of that metadata for the build process for Zephyr applications at build time. And we want to have that, that SBOM express metadata about file hashes, uh, express metadata about licenses, and then about the relationships between the sources, the intermediate build artifacts, and that final binary. Um, and from my side, I, I think it, uh, yeah, I'm, so I'm an attorney with the LF. I'm also kind of a, do some development on the side, but my interest is particularly on the licensing side of it. How do we track which, what were the open source licenses for those source files? How did those flow through to binaries? But as part of building that and gathering that data, we're also gathering data about these other details, about the hashes, the relationships, and so on. And that's going to be particularly of interest to the security side of things, um, shining the transparency into which versions were shared. So, um, so the particular goals here are to, first off, do this at build time, so not doing it after the fact. Second, to make it fully automated, so to make it something that's as low, uh, as low pain for a Zephyr, a Zephyr application developer as possible. So having it be as simple as possible for them to uh, to generate an SBOM without having to use third-party tools, take, a, take any significant additional steps in their build process. Uh, third, we want to try to do it without leveraging external knowledge sources. And this is something where, you know, there are a variety of tools out there, both proprietary and open source, that can, uh, can generate SBOMs, can uh, pull in more information about what you're building. And those are, those are fantastic tools. Those are things that should be used. But here, a part of what my goal was, was to keep it as limited as possible so that it's something that is just occurring within the Zephyr build process itself. And then finally, kind of touched on this before, but not rewriting existing build systems, just leveraging what's already there, having it be an additional extension that someone can use if they want to, but that they don't have to kind of muck up their own build process in order to do it. Um, and I touched on this last point already, just that uh, with Zephyr, because of the nature of the project, it's something where we're, we're really not focused on third-party dependencies such as JavaScript uh, or, or Python modules that we're pulling in. It's really focused on the Zephyr source code itself and someone's application that they're building on top of that, on top of that OS. Uh, so the format that we used for the SBOM is SPDX, which David touched on earlier. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with it, SPDX is a language that, uh, for expressing 
uh, software composition metadata, including components, licenses, and so on. Um, it's currently in the ISO publication process, um, and I think you know, moving towards ISO full uh, full deployment as an ISO standard. So, um, so the the simple way to do this, and kind of the the starting point approach, the version kind of version zero approach for this is to just run the build, scan all of the source all of the source files and all of the build products that get generated, scan them for hashes, scan them for licenses if there's license information in there. Um, and then assemble that data into a tag value SPDX document. Um, so, and this is something that you can do pretty easily leveraging other existing tools from SPDX. Um, and I've got a link here to an example where you can do this. So this is kind of the, the simpler, the naive approach. Um, and this is good. This is something that can be easily, you know, somebody, if they want to use one of these third, one of these external tools, they can pretty easily do this and add it into their build process. Um, the drawbacks to this, so one is that it is an additional step that, to take after the build, and it is something that's using separate tooling outside the build process. Um, the other drawback, which really, I kind of got into some more details here, but the other drawback is that using an external tool, it's likely not going to know a lot about the specifics of a project's build process. And so it may, you know, it may take some additional effort to distinguish between the sources and build artifacts, it also might not provide you with very much detail about which sources are built into which binaries or which, what are the different stages of the build process. It's more just a snapshot of everything that came out at the end of the day. So this can be a good starting point, but it's what I think what we were looking to do was to have something that would go a step further and provide some more detailed uh, knowledge about the that build process and the relationships between the stages. So. Um, what we decided to do was to leverage metadata that CMake provides. And because Zephyr already uses CMake as, its, as part of its build infrastructure, uh, what we did here was to look at how can we leverage what CMake already gives us to, you know, to take, that, take metadata it gives us and reformulate it uh, and express it as SPDX in an SBOM format. Um, and so CMake has this really useful functionality uh, that they call their file-based API, which essentially what it boils down to is before running CMake, if you create a, an empty file at a, at a well-defined uh, location, this API v1 query directory path, if you create that, that path and that empty file and then run CMake as usual, then in addition to generating all of the build, the build artifacts and the build uh, files that CMake produces, it also outputs metadata in JSON format about what CMake is doing and about what the different build uh, sources and build artifacts are going to be. And so it outputs it as, as JSON, it gives data about the different targets that are the build stages and it gives data and then provides other JSON files that, and I realize this might be hard to see here, but basically other, other JSON files about what sources are being used, what are the different artifacts or uh, sorry, command line arg arguments that will be sent to compile those sources, and then what are the libraries that the sources are being built into. So all of that, CMake just for free gives you as JSON if you configure it to use this API. So what we did for Zephyr and for the West tool that, that the Zephyr community has built is essentially just to add on an extension to that to say, um, so steps two and three here are what anybody would do if they're using West to build a Zephyr product. They'll, they'll make a call to West, I think it's West build, that will run CMake, G CMake generates the build files and then Zephyr, and then uh, it it'll b use those build files to generate the Zephyr artifacts just as usual. Essentially what we did was just to add on an extension called West SPDX that enables that CMake to, to generate those JSON files. And then at, after the build is done, takes then processes those JSON files and does some other analysis to generate the SPDX files. And just in the interest of time, I'm not going to go too much into the details about this, but essentially what the West SPDX process is doing is parsing those CMake, uh, those JSON metadata files that we get from CMake, looking at what sources and what build artifacts it, uh, it says that it's going to be, that it's building, um, analyzes them. It, it optionally does some dry runs of compiling uh, with those particular command line flags to get more data about what, which particular header files get included. Um, and then it uh, essentially processes it all into SPX data. So it generates an SPX ID for each package that's being built, each uh, source file and each uh, binary file that's being processed. 
Um, along the way, it scans those for the SPDX license identifier statements. So it, because the Zephyr community has added those into most of their uh, most of their source files, we can get information about the licensing for those files essentially for free. And then at the end, it's creating SPDX documents to express that metadata. So going back to this slide real quick, um, you remember this is where we kind of broke out the different source files into uh, logical components for the Zephyr operating system, the Zephyr SDK, if you're using that and your own application. And then at the bottom, the build, the build artifacts. So each of those is, as essentially separate, separate blocks. Uh, what we're doing then is generating an SPDX document for each one and using the functionality that's built into SPDX, into the SPDX language to link them together. So um, just a, a, an example of that, um, the way that this is done in, in SPDX is what they call relationships. So in the uh, Zephyr SPDX file, which is about the, which contains the data about the Zephyr sources, uh, for each source file there, we're creating, which, so the file itself is shown on the right. We're creating in the middle there a uh, an SPDX metadata record for that file, giving it an SPDX ID and including it in that Zephyr SPDX document. And then on the bottom in the build artifacts SPDX document, where we wanna indicate that a particular build artifact is generated from one or more source files, we can now link out by reference and create a relationship to express that it is generated from that source file. And in SPDX, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend time on uh, the specifics here, but if you wanna take a look at the slides, this shows some details about how the specifics of the SPDX tag value format and how to express that, how to have a, in the build artifacts SPDX document, make a reference out to the external document for the Zephyr sources, define a, an ID for it, and then have relationships that, uh, that reference that externally defined uh, document and reference metadata from that externally defined SPDX document. So um, ultimately what this gives us is it gives us automatic generation of SBOMs um, in SPDX format, in tag value format, and ex which express metadata about what we talked about earlier. So which source files are used to build which binaries, the hashes for those source files and for the binaries so that we know exactly which, uh, which source files were used. And then additionally information about the licenses for those source files, because we can get that from the, what the Zephyr community has added in as those SPX license identifier statements. So um, areas for improvement here, uh, part of what we're looking to do is, what I'm hoping to do is to align it uh, more closely with the NTIA SBOM recommended fields to make sure that we're covering all of those appropriately. Um, looking to understand and cover a broader set of the community build cases. Um, because what, it, what we've done here is really focused on, I think, this sort of default process of using using WEST, using the Zephyr SDK um, to generate these, kind of assuming that those are in place, which they will be for many developers, but looking to understand and see if we can cover a broader set of use cases where someone might not be using just those built-in tools. Uh, and then also looking to extend the licensing related functionality. So gathering other information like copyright notices and so on. Um, and what I'd say just as the takeaways from this, you know, I've been focused heavily on Zephyr specifically and IoT and embedded, the kind of the embedded context generally. But I think kind of what we learned from this is that SBOMs really can be generated as part of a build system for any sort of software development. Um, doing so, doing it and generating SPDX SBOMs at build time, uh, it can be met, ideally it can be minimal effort for the developers using that platform and to generate these SPOMs and provide and make them available to downstream consumers of, uh, of a product. Um, it can be done using, using and leveraging the existing build infrastructure. Um, and particularly for free and open source projects, what I'd encourage is to look at building them into the project's build infrastructure itself. And doing that at the project level enables all of the downstream repackagers or application developers or so on to essentially for free or for very little cost, be able to generate SPDX SBOMs for their own uh, deployments and their own products and services and uh, developments on top of the project. And doing that really improves the entire eco ecosystem because it makes it possible to easily 
generate this metadata and archive it and distribute it in a way that kind of the end users can ultimately uh, consume. Um, particularly for embedded devices, build time, I think really is the right time to gather this metadata because build, when, you're, when you're actually building the binary is the, the point in time where you know the most about what's going into it. And generating and archiving that metadata really gives both you and your downstream end users and consumers in knowledge about that, that information that is gonna be extremely hard to try to uh, retrofit and gather after the fact. Um, I think one thing from this that, that we kind of learned is that S, for SPDX documents, that linking process between multiple documents and the uh, relationship syntax can be very expressive and is, is both expressive and flexible. So you can express a lot of different, uh, different facts about the build process as part of that. Uh, and then finally, I think I'd say just, I'd encourage projects or, uh, or uh, whether it's open source or proprietary, anyone who's looking to integrate a process like this into their own build infrastructure, I would encourage starting small and improving over time. So start with kind of the simplest possible approach that you can to create an SBOM as part of your build system and then add more onto it over time. You know, add, get more expressive about relationships between different elements, add in more, inf more information about dependencies or other elements and grow it over time. But really starting small with something that just generates a basic SBOM can be the starting point. So, uh, and with that, um, I guess we've got a bit of time for Q&A. Um, so I will take a look at, David, um, feel free to jump in with questions or I'll also take a look at the chat and yeah. see what questions we've got in here. Yeah, take a look at the chat in particular. We've got a question that's been hanging for a little bit. Does the build SPDX capture the SBOM for the building, at, for the tooling and build environment? In, in the particular case that you were talking about, obviously it could, but the question is in your particular case. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I think it we're, we're at the early stages of doing that. So it captures a little bit when it comes to, let me go back here. When it comes, so the SDK, for instance, if you're use, if someone's using the Zephyr SDK, then there's an optional flag that'll capture information about headers that are being included from the SDK. Um, at this point, it's not doing more than that. It's not going into, okay, what are the particular, what's the particular version of the SDK that you're using? Because that also encapsulates the various tools, the compiler, the linker, the other parts that you're using for your particular build. So my hope is to extend it to also capture that information. And that's something that I think with relatively easily could be added in, um, particularly where someone is using the Zephyr SDK to record what version, what version of the tools and so on. But at the moment, no, it's not. We're, we're really focused primarily just at the sources and the headers that are being included. Yeah, keep going through the chat. I think we've sure. got some other interesting questions. Yeah, so uh, so let's see. So a question here about how the mechanism will cope when external libraries are included in build systems. Yeah, so that's something that I, I haven't focused on as much here for Zephyr, but it's something that in many contexts, uh, you know, is going to be highly relevant to people's build infrastructure, because particularly when you're using something where you're pulling in third-party dependencies, whether, you know, whether from external libraries or from a uh, third-party packaging such as npm or uh, or pypy or you know whatever your whatever your particular ecosystem is that's going to be highly relevant is pulling in that metadata and I think some of the what we'll hear um, probably from I think from Thomas or Thomas in the next session and then from about some of the other tools later today will probably focus more on that sort of situation where you're pulling in information about third-party libraries and dependencies that get included um, so I see there's a question about uh, let's see about uh, in included headers as an optional step. Um, you know, how important that is for tracking header files in the SBOM. I think that's probably going to depend on context. You're going to depend on the particular developer, whether or not you're going to see that as important. From my view, I think it's important to include if you can, because it's just more information. It's more that you know about the build. Um, people, you know, a, a particular application developer might decide that they want to keep us, you know, generate a smaller SBOM, they don't want to cover that sort of information, that's going to be a trade-off they'll make. But um, having the functionality there and having it optional is something that at least has it available if someone chooses to. Okay, and any other, uh, let's see, so another question that just came in, and, and David, feel free to cut me off when we're, uh, when we're getting close on time. I know we, if we've we're... got a couple more minutes and yep. I want, carry on. 
So let's see. So there's one that just came in about um, the architecture of the linking flow, but um, it, when interacting with product teams, they don't maintain this high-level, low-level architecture diagrams. How did so? How do you deal with scenarios or convincing different teams? That's important to emphasize that for binary analysis. So I think here I'd, I'd maybe take a step up and go back to the slide that David had showed originally in his in his presentation about the different stages of development and going from the individual developers to the build and release teams to the um, you know other 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 stages and other teams that within an organization are going to be involved with building software, and I think a couple pieces of that one is going to be that this process that I'm talking about here I've been thinking about it and talking about it largely from the perspective of an organization that's developing a, a product or a service then deploying it to end users. But I think even within an organization, the end users can be the next step in the chain. It can be the next, uh, you know, the, going from the product developers to the build and release team or so on. And so I think having it be part of the build system to be able to generate these, these sort of files and produce SBOMs, you know, the next step in the chain could then be also consuming SBOMs and making use of it. But to your point about convincing the product teams about this being important, I think that's something that ties into the broader, you know, the broader messaging of what we're talking about today and uh, of just the importance of understanding the ingredients for your software and then having the tooling be smart enough to make decisions about that so that it's something that can be more and more automated. If I may jump in, Steve. Please, I do. Think Please do. Automate, automate, automate. I mean, if, if, <laughs> yeah. if it requires that people take special steps yeah. every time, uh, that's a lost cause and, and frankly, rather insane. I think uh, <laughs> you know, when, if it's part of the build process, you know, they build and things happen. And I, I think, you know, it, it, I noticed that one of the last words Steve mentioned was automate. <laughs> and uh, I, I see there's, and, and just, uh, yeah, echoing that, that was the, really the goal of this was to have it be as low touch for Zephyr developers as possible. So it can be as simple as making a, a call to West, West SPDX at the same time that you do West build. And that it's nothing more than that, that there's no external tools to deploy or call separately or anything like that. Uh, one comment in here, I see a question about SPDX being focused on uh, RTOS and binary. Does it support container or image supply chain? Yeah, I'll say that if, if this presentation is the only thing you're, you've seen, or the first thing you're seeing about SPDX, you might get the impression that it's focused on RTOS, and it really isn't. It's a, uh, it's a broader language for expressing metadata about software composition generally, and it can cover a variety of use cases. There's a lot of folks who are looking at it for containers, and I think you'll, we'll probably, I think we'll be hearing more about that later today. Um, but yeah, certainly it's much broader than uh, embedded and real-time operating systems. There's a lot that you can cover and a lot of use cases that aren't focused on that at all. So, um, all right, so I think we're, we're a few minutes ahead. So I think, let me go ahead and, I think David, unless you, unless you have any other questions, I'd say maybe let's give the time back and yeah. stay a bit ahead of, yeah, I, I think that would be wise. Uh, so, uh, so Steve, thank 